One second here, we'll go ahead and get us kicked off. All right. How's everyone doing? Cool. Well, uh, I think we got here safely. We can take these off for the moment. Yep. So uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, this has been uh, a long time coming. This is a super exciting topic for us, uh, and we're really passionate about it. Uh, we've worked really hard to try to provide you all the necessary context you need to understand what happened and what the implications are. And um, we're going to do our best to kind of take you along the journey as best as possible. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience in advance. Uh, but first, I really want to introduce uh, some of the other researchers. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Aaron. Uh, I, this is not an overstatement. Uh, if it was not for Aaron, I would not be standing here. Uh, I don't know if much of this work had have gotten done. Uh, he was absolutely the tip of the spear. Uh, and I can't say enough good things about him. He's one of the most talented and kindest researchers I've ever worked with. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Bobak, for the kind words. Uh, so I want to introduce Nick Draffin, uh, who is one of the most talented security engineers, security researchers I have ever worked with. Uh, he, he accomplishes so much stuff. He works on so much stuff uh, beyond all of this that, uh, yeah, he's, he's just incredible. He's amazing. Thanks, Aaron. That's very nice. Uh, yeah, very pl pleased to meet you, or pleased to have met you and know you. Uh, yeah, and I would like to introduce uh, Babak Javadi, who I'm also uh, pleased to call my friend, and, and I really appreciate uh, our uh, friendship and the things that we've worked on together. Amazing, uh, really kind person, uh, one of the best hardware hackers I know, and uh, we have to we can constantly compete with, for like who has the newest tool or who is on the latest firmware of something. He has a tendency to update firmware at the worst possible moment, like right before a critical training or something. It's time to do the latest GPU update. So, it's my friend Bobak. So. Uh, so, fun fact: uh, we're all really awkward about talking about ourselves, so we came up with this shtick of introducing each other instead. So, hopefully, that worked okay. <laughs> Um, I do want to uh, talk about uh, uh, one researcher who wasn't able to join us on the stage, uh, and that's Kate. Uh, Kate has also been uh, involved with the project. Uh, she's also one of the finest, most talented uh, hackers I've had the pleasure of working with. We're honored to call her a friend, uh, and she has definitely been a part of this journey as well. So just want to give a quick thank you to Kate. Where is Kate? There's Kate. All right, so let's get started. Topics of the hour, because holy shit, 75 minutes. This is the longest talk. Who gave us the slot? All right, we'll, tr we'll do our best to make the best of it. Uh, we got a couple things to cover. We're gonna talk about access control systems uh, and a couple of really critical elements of it. Uh, we're gonna talk about obsession, because this has been all consuming, as we will discuss. And of course, the reason why you are all here a heist, right? That's, that's the ex really exciting stuff that we're here for. Uh, but before we begin, uh, Aaron, can you tell us a little bit more about like, why they should stick around? Like, what does all this actually mean? Absolutely. So if you look at this video, you can see that there are two cards. These are HID CIOS cards, theoretically unclonable. And yet, if you look, they have the same ID card number when scanned, right? Uh, so we have cloned the unclonable, and in this talk, we're going to show you how we did it. So I mentioned obsessions, because uh, we all get that, right? Uh, this project has been kind of all-consuming for all three of us in different ways. Uh, it has took over my entire COVID, basically, because we had nothing else to do other than uh, wake up, work for 12 to 14 hours and then go to bed and then rinse and repeat for you know a few months basically uh and even in got into shower thoughts in the shower we can't stop thinking about yeah. this stuff essentially like thinking about this research when we wake up thinking about it before we go to bed waking up in the light, middle of the night thinking about it going to dinner with our significant others and all we can think about is hid research so that's yeah, yeah what brought us here today 
Yeah, and uh, you know, we have so many HID readers at this point, it's kind of crazy. Uh, so many, in fact, that my now husband uh, actually used an HID reader in proposing to me a few years ago. It's true. Yeah. We're not kidding. Uh, but yeah, it, this is collectively uh, thousands of hours collectively, uh, hundreds of readers, way, way too many dollars. Uh, I, I was considering trying to tabulate it, no. and then I thought better of it. So let's just say it was a lot. Uh, and of course, very little sleep, including preparing for this talk. So here we are. Uh, we are going to go kind of quick on a couple of topics. Uh, as long as this talk is, uh, it is not a soup to nuts on how access control works. But in order for you to understand why this stuff is important, you do need some basic building blocks. So we've worked really hard to try to give you guys those basic building blocks as quickly as possible. If something doesn't fully track, it's okay. This stuff is kind of weird. But I suspect that you guys will get it pretty easily. So the main fo foundation of all of this stuff uh, is physical access control systems. And these are, of course, physical security controls that are designed to control access into or out of areas. Uh, and there's a lot of different components to these, right? There's readers, there's cards, there's door lock hardware and stuff like that. And ultimately, there's a few main uh, tenants that all these systems have to be focused on and hit in order to be successful in the marketplace. In order for it to be viable, these things have to be cheap. They have to be cost effective. Because for literally anyone else except us in this room, security isn't fun, it's a cost. And so since businesses have to make money, for better or for worse, uh, they don't really necessarily like spending money on security because they exist to maximize profit. So cost effectiveness actually has a huge, huge driver for how this stuff gets designed and how it sticks around. It also, of course, has to be easy to use because security that gets in your way uh, and prevents you from doing your job or getting where you need to be also sucks and incurs a different kind of cost, both to you psychologically and to the business. Uh, by way of example, I recall there was a pen test that we were on and we noticed that uh, during reconnaissance, we noticed there was a side door that people kept coming out of and it wouldn't latch all the way. And we're like, we can just walk in here. And so we used it several times. And I remember that in the after action report, we brought it up. And we're like, by the way, do you guys know this door doesn't latch and it goes right into your office? And the head of facilities was there and he's like, yeah, l let me tell you about that door, see? <laughs> uh, so this is a very efficient uh, building. It seals very, very well. And when the weather is nice and the HVAC system's not running, we have everything adjusted and that's fine. But then when the HVAC system is running, there's a positive air pressure inside the building. And now the door closers won't actually close the doors fully. So we go through and we tighten all the door closers. And we're like, okay, it's good. And then the weather gets nice again and the HVAC system is off and then the doors start slamming. And so we got all these trouble tickets of people complaining that they're on meetings, they're on sales calls, and the door is slamming. And so we had to choose between security and keeping our employees happy. What do you think won? Of course, it wouldn't be a story if it was security. It was the latter. So simplicity, ease of use, that's a huge deal. The golden rule of access control is never get in the way of doing business, for better or for worse. And that really drives a lot of this stuff. So there's a couple components you need to understand about access control. And if you've been doing any of this stuff at all, you probably already know about this, but we'll give you the building blocks anyway. So we have cards, we have readers, we have door hardware, like an electric strike or latch, and we have door controller of some kind. This is an embedded device that controls access. It's what makes the logical decision. And of course, it has a database of some kind that it synchronizes with and connects to. And ultimately, the sequence diagram, the way it works, is we have, we'll zoom in here. So we have a card presentation. So that's you presenting your card. The reader activates it. And then some WGAN data is retrieved from the card. It's sent to the reader. The reader goes ahead and grabs that and sends it to all the way to the controller. That's what that beep is. And then the controller makes a decision. And if you have access, it activates the relay. And that's basically it. But for this talk, we're not gonna talk about the back half of that. We're really only just gonna focus on that first part, card to reader. 
because that's such a critical aspect and it's oftentimes the most exposed element of the access control system. And we'll see all the ways that people have tried to do it right and still sometimes you struggle. So what is WGAN data? This is something that's important to understand about access control if you haven't had to deal with it before. WGAN data is a static binary authentication string that represents a very simple series of numbers. You got your facility code, you got a card number, and you also have a set of rules that are used to encode these into a static binary string, and that's called the bit format. And we don't need to get into the details of it. All you got to know is that it's a little static binary string. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. There is a difference, though, technically, if you want to get technical about it, I suspect you all do, between a card and a credential. See, RFID cards of any kind are really just memory storage devices, like a USB stick, but a lot shittier. They don't become a credential until you put access control data on it. And so technically, these two concepts are discrete concepts. So something to keep in mind, the technology is different from how you put data on that technology. And if you really think about it, we think that all fundamental aspects of access control can be boiled down into either an encode or decode operation, storage or retrieval. So let's talk about how storage works. How do we make that credential in, a first, in the first place? How do we go from card to credential? Well, you can see we have a facility code and card number that goes into some set of rules called the bit format, and you produce WGAN data, and that WGAN data is then stored on the card. If you're having trouble visualizing this, let's show you. So, for example, let's say we have a facility code of 42 that we want to encode. We'll go ahead and grab our handy-dandy calculator, and we'll convert that decimal to binary. So that will give us these eight bits here. Then we have our unique card number. That's, of course, 1337, obviously. And we'll go ahead and convert that to binary as well. And what you see at the bottom left there, that's the bit format. That defines where these bits go in that long string. So we'll go ahead and take the facility code and card number, we'll drop that into our bit format, do it some parity bit calculations that we don't need to get into, and that is our authentication string. That's what the door controller is actually waiting for. And depending on the credential, we might have to add a preamble to it, but then that whole blob gets written to the card. That's it. That's what a credential basically is. Very simple static data stored on a memory device. Similarly, when you're reading a card, it's just that in reverse. So you have your card memory, you gotta get in there, get it out, that's what the reader does, and then, whoop, went too fast, my apologies. Too fast for my own good, there we go. Encode, da-da, okay. So the reader grabs that credential data, it transmits it to the door controller, and now the controller has to interpret it. So what does that look like? I'm so glad you didn't ask. So here's our credential, we present it to the reader. The reader grabs that credential data, retrieves it, it processes it, rips out that preamble, sends the WGAN to the door controller, and now that door controller interprets that data, breaks it back apart into its constituent components, and we have, of course, our original facility code and card number. Very simple, happens in the blink of an eye. So in this example, we're talking about unauthenticated cards. You'll notice in this diagram, there was no password needed to do either of these operations. And in fact, if you guys have ever used a prox credential or old school credential, uh, if you've used a flipper to clone, you know, low frequency tag, uh, that's the type of card we're talking about. These are cards that don't require any security or authentication in order to read that data off of it. So you'll see in the sequence diagram, you present the card, the reader powers it on, it spits out the data, the reader takes the data, and then send, forwards it to the controller, simple as that. But if you have unauthenticated credentials, you have, of course, unauthenticated problems. Generally speaking, this is an issue because there's no protection for the data at rest, there's no protection for the data in motion, and as a result, it's very easy to tamper with that data, it's very easy to clone that data. So what's the solution? Authentication, right? Easy enough. So we can add an authentication layer in. You'll notice right over here, we add a little boop, mutual authentication. So now, in order for us to access that memory for reading or for writing, we have to authenticate with that card, simple enough. We can even go a step further. 
and we can, before writing that data, we can encrypt it and put it on the card. And that's what we call actually transport encryption. And it also adds another step right there. So now the reader has to authenticate with the card, unlock it, grab the encrypted data, and now it has to then decrypt it, usually with a different key, and then get the WIGAN data, send it to the controller. So this is the cornerstone of modern access control in terms of how RFID cards work. But of course, most security, most problems, my friends, right? Because if you have keys that you gotta use, you have to manage those keys. They have to be generated appropriately. They have to be stored properly. And of course, you have to use them correctly. If you write them down on a post-it or say put them in an Android app, mobile app, and not realize it and people disassemble it and find it, that's kind of a problem. We can also go a step further, we're just touching on this topic very lightly. If we wanna make sure that we don't put the same key in every card, we can of course do diversification. So a key diversification uh, function, or KDF as it's colloquially referred to, basically takes a secret master key some sort of unique value tied to the credential, like a CSN or UID, and sometimes an optional salt or piece of context, and that goes into the KDF, and what comes out is a unique key that is just for that credential and nothing else. And that's a pretty solid system. That's the best practice, and almost every vendor follows it these days. Now, you might wonder how are these master keys generated? How are they used? Because any of you who have ever bought access control systems or used them, you may not realize or may not have thought that you don't actually get to pick that key. Generally speaking, these keys fall into two categories, and that's shared master keys and custom master keys. So with a shared master key, these are cards and readers that are interoperable by default. You buy the card, you buy the reader, and it just works. It's great. It's great for integrators, it's great for customers, it's really fast and easy to install, and of course, because it's so easy, that means your cost is lower but maybe you got special security needs and you want uh, a custom key. And so now a unique key is generated for you and someone has to manage it. Maybe it's you, maybe it's your vendor. Uh, and of course, if you do that though, now you need to order those cards and those credentials uh, and those readers on demand. They have to be programmed specifically for you. Because of this extra step, this is a process and a technology that is kind of poorly understood uh, a lot of integrators don't really like to do this because it kind of gets in the way of the process. It's something that's confusing for a lot of customers. Uh, and ultimately, it really slows down the process as well, which people, of course, don't like. But no matter what you do, whether you use unauthenticated credentials or authenticated credentials or ones with encryption, whatever it is, the reader still outputs Wigand, which is really interesting but we're not gonna get too far down that path today. Before we continue further, we wanted to share with you a little bit of context. As any of you guys know who've ever learned any of this stuff, played with anything, done anything even remotely hackery, we all stand on the shoulders of giants before us that have paved the way before for us to learn from and then build on top of that. And this is no exception. In our opinion, one of the big pieces of research that really kind of set us on this path started back in 2011, 2010 rather, when Milos released his paper, uh, Heart of Darkness. Uh, and it was one of the first really interesting ways of compromising sensitive cryptographic key material that was supposed to be kept secure in the reader and doing it in a really, really innovative way. Nick, what, what do you want to say about this? Yeah, so the predecessor, predecessor to the system that we're gonna talk about today, uh, iClass, was introduced in 2002, uh, and for quite a while it was a relatively secure system. It used a modern credential, it uh, had authentication, key, uh, authentication keys, it had encryption keys, uh, it was a relatively secure implementation, but use of uh, cheaper hardware and uh, inadequate key protection kind of ultimately led to the recovery of those keys that made the system secure. So uh, it was originally based on an inside secure or inside contactless at the time, uh, PicoPass chip, uh, and it was more mainly popular in North America. Uh, it saw some penetration in other markets, but it was pr primarily in North America. 
Uh, I like iClass legacy credential looks like this from a memory map perspective. Um, there are unencrypted variants or encrypted variants. Funny enough, uh, the credential itself or the card itself controls whether or not it's encrypted or plain text. So what you're... Oh. oh. Nope, it's going to switch on. Yeah, so... It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you see, like, two examples here of uh, an encrypted card and an unencrypted card. Uh, suffice to say that um, having the credential itself specify whether it's encrypted or not might not be the best idea. But the hardware for this ecosystem was a few different revisions. There was Rev A, B, and C. Rev B really wasn't uh, in the channel very long. There's not a lot of customers with Rev B readers. Uh, but Milos selected Rev A readers as a target uh, because it's the earlier generation. There might be some bugs. Uh, that's, that's a typical thing for hardware hackers to do is select an earlier revision. Uh, it used a relatively com rel relative commo commodity pick microcontroller, uh, which was not hard against uh, attacks uh, that Milos performed. So uh, when iClass was introduced, this is where the concept of the shared standard keys and uh, what the vendor calls elite keys was introduced. Uh, so most customers went with a standard key option. Uh, elite keys were for uh, customers that had or were concerned about advanced threats uh, so that they, uh, their cards wouldn't work on other readers and vice versa. So uh, those cards and readers are built to order. Um, customers don't actually get to choose that key. It's chosen for you. There's some uh, good research about that we'll talk about later. Uh, but it was, uh, Elite is probably one of the, if not the most uh, prominent vendor managed key program that exists uh, in the access control space. So uh, in this ecosystem, there was an encoder, uh, and that encoder uh, had some use cases for stored value applications, vending, uh, things like that. And it was just another reader that had an interface that you could connect to with your PC and talk to it with a protocol. But this is what Milos targeted for his, his research. And his research, the paper just titled Heart of Darkness, uh, it relied on using two readers. Uh, it was a destructive attack against each one. Uh, with the first reader, you would erase the boot block uh, because the debug interface would let you do uh, some limited things. And in that erased boot block, uh, he wrote a dumper program to dump the rest of the memory. And then on the second reader, uh, he did the opposite. He erased the end part of the memory and wrote the dumper program at the very end, which then looped back around and got the first bit that he didn't have from the first reader. So this led to a complete recovery of the firmware and all associated data with that system. Let's see if this might work. Way too loud this time. All right. Uh, just a quick add. Uh, one thing that I found really cool about this attack is that this chip technically had read protection. So they thought the keys were secure, True. but he found a very innovative way to get his code to run inside the chip without erasing the rest of it. And he found quite by accident that code running inside the microprocessor was kind of behind the firewall, so to speak. And so it was able to then get access to those reprotected areas of memory. And that basic concept of, I don't have access to that thing, so I'm going to find something else that has access to that thing and try to manipulate my way in, that is so critical to so many different aspects of hacking. Yeah, exactly. So once you actually have that extracted firmware and data, you can start to look through it. Uh, you kind of have broken the chain of custody. You now have those keys that were meant to be kept secret. Uh, and through analysis, it ultimately revealed uh, the algorithms that were even used by the platform. Uh, it prompted a lot of subsequent research over the next uh, couple of years, and uh, primarily by a handful of European researchers. Uh, there are some uh, really uh, interesting uh, cryptanalysis talks. There's a few of the papers that are listed here. Uh, fantastic reads. It really These are deep math heavy papers. So uh, I'll, I'll be frank, it, it's over my head a lot of it. Yes. <laughs> Testing one, two, there we go. Uh, so yeah, this is truly next level research. Uh, and from a failure perspective, uh, choosing a commodity microcontroller, even with reprotection, 
uh, is not necessarily the proper key protection mechanism that you'd want for a system like this, especially if you've got standard or shared keys across all sorts of customers, potentially globally. So um, with the uh, data integrity portion of this, it being con optional and controlled by the card, also um, maybe not the best security decision. If, if customers want encryption, they should be able to specify that on the reader, not the credential. Uh, and w one other like kind of issue that plagues this platform, not just this vendor, but just in this industry as a whole, is firmware upgrades or updating devices in the field. If you take these readers and they're at like your doors, if you have five doors, it's not much of a problem. But if you have 50,000 doors with readers that are spread out across the globe, if you want to update those and you have to go to each one of them, that's quite the task. So centralized updates are an issue just kind of industry-wide that uh, we're hoping to get some attention on uh, in the next couple of years with uh, product advancements and whatnot. So. Right. And I think one of the really interesting things to understand and take away from this, if you're not familiar with any of this technology already, is that uh, even though they had uh, this encryption layer on there as well, <clears throat> what people found is that once you have the authentication key, you didn't even have to decrypt it in order to clone it because there was no validation of which card that data belonged to. Yeah. So you could actually just take one card, unlock it, grab the encrypted blob of data, throw it onto another one, and even though the serial number of that card was different, it would still work. Exactly. Uh, which really kind of undermined a lot of the integrity of the data. So when we talk about data tampering, that's what we're talking about. Um, and it's a critical aspect that you'll see coming up as a theme over and over. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> subsequent, like as a result of this research, it actually led to a really cool new platform, uh, really the rebirth of iClass. And uh, to, talk to, to talk to you about that, I'd like to have uh, Aaron come up if you're willing. We have a phoenix rising from the ashes here. Uh, it's truly a next generation, next level platform. It, it, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, it, it, if it looks a little bit dramatic, it's because in many ways you could argue that uh, that original platform really kind of got burned down in a lot of ways. Uh, but to HID's credit, they actually came back pretty hard. And when SC came out, it was, it was kind of a BFD. Aaron, tell us about it. Sure. So. Um, sure. So to replace iClass comes iClass SE. Um, launched in 2011, technically it stands for uh, SIO enabled. Uh, SIO stands for Secure Identity Object. Yes, nested. Uh, a lot of confusing terminology here. Uh, but in short, they got a lot of things right here, right? Um, they, you know, HID clearly learned a lot of lessons of things that went wrong with iClass, and so iClass SE really was, you know, or, you know arguably the, the secure edition, right, of the platform. Um, so it can, it, you know, it, it, this name iClass SE refers to to uh, three different things: a platform, a reader, a, a, a credential technology. Uh, there's a lot. Of, you, you can see how that might be confusing, right? Uh, and it has been, right? Um, to this day. Oh, try that. There you go. To this day, uh, there is still an incredible amount of confusion over what iClass SE actually means. And I don't mean just from like everyday users. I mean industry professionals, people who this is their job, nothing but access control, selling it, installing it, maintaining it. Uh, the, the phrase iClass SE is very, very nebulous. But when you look at it at a technical level, you can understand why there's so much confusion because they reuse the same name for very different discrete aspects of the technology. Uh, so we do our best to separate things out here for you, but it's important to understand that depending on the context in which you invoke the phrase iClass SE, what we're referring to can vary. Indeed. And, um... So one of the interesting things about iClass SE as a, as a reader platform, uh, close to the mic. 
Right. One of the interesting things about iClass SE as a reader platform uh, is that it, it is very much upgradable. And so, you know, they've added support over the years for newer other credential technologies, right? Something that was not easily possible with the original iClass reader platform. So right in 2011, right, we had, you know, those four iClass SE most, most significantly. 2012, we got CIOS, which we'll talk about later, 2014 mobile, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the, so you know, I mentioned that term before, SIO, secure identity object. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what that is. Um, so with uh, iClass, right, you know, uh, one of the things that, that uh, you know, Bobak was talking about and, and Nick as well was the fact that there was nothing to cryptographically bind the encrypted data payload on the card to that particular card. And that's one of the main things that the SIO, you know, endeavors to, to fix, right? So it is an, you know, ASN.1 encoded payload. It is cryptographically bound to a specific card, right, by its, its serial number or, or UID, and the data in it is encrypted. So in other words, if you take a, an SIO from one card and you put it on another card with a different serial number, it won't work. Uh, and that, that, that's a big deal, right? Like, that's a big step forward in terms of the security um, of, of the, the SIO-based credential technology. Um, yeah. I, I want to clarify, just in case, because it's easy to get lost in, in the weeds on this uh, if, it, if it's a new concept to you. The main gain of an SIO, a secure object of any kind, is not only is the data encrypted, but as he mentioned, it's cryptographically bound, it's tied to something unique and unchangeable about that credential, such that if you mess with it, if you tamper with it, you change even one bit of data, it breaks the signature and the reader consider, considers it invalid. It's a very important and critical uh, piece of um, security. Indeed. So let's talk about the advantages of SIOs. Um, so we, are, we, we already spoke a bit about some of this, but there's a really good sort of way to think of this, which is that an SIO is kind of like a tamper seal, right? If you have the card, right, and the, the weekend data on the card, the SIO is ensuring that, uh, well, effectively it's a tamper seal, right? You can't tamper with it at all. Um, and it's independent of card technology. Uh, it's, it's a really, you know, overall good design. Um, so the first major technology, right, to talk about with regard to SIOs is iClass SE, right? So uh, uses the same, um, like, card technology as iClass, right, which is, which is called PicoPass. Uh, it was still cost effective, it was cheap. Um, the silicon wasn't broken, um, right? It, it had good read distance. It, it, you know, it, honestly, a lot of things about iClass as, as a card technology were good, at least for the time, right? Um, so iClass SE essentially uh, took iClass and made it more or less secure. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, if you see iClass credentials, you can see like an SC or an SR marking to indicate that there's an SIO on the card. Yeah. This is, uh, this is one of the first places where you begin to have that confusion, right? We talked about how iClass SE gets reused over and over. So now we're talking about iClass SE cards specifically. So they just took the same card technology that they had already, but because their keys were broken and their algorithms were broken, yada, 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 they said, hey, you know what? The container's still not so bad. So why don't we just create a new data model? and change our keys and change our algorithms and all those things uh, and basically kind of remix it. And it did pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. But let's talk a little bit about the limitations of PicoPass, right? The, the card technology that I, uh, you know, that iClass is built on, right? It has limited memory. Uh, you know, you really only have two application areas. Uh, so they're, you, know, they're, you can't have too many different uses, right, for an iClass card. It doesn't have replay protection. Um, you know, there are a number of, of, of bugs uh, in terms of reader firmware impacting iClass and, and PicoPass specifically. Uh, more, more recently, PicoPass became EOL, uh, and HID actually had to, had to uh, develop a custom IC that emulates PicoPass so they can continue to sell iClass cards. Um, 
challenges of not owning your whole supply chain, right? Yeah. They bought someone else's chip, they said, hey, we're gonna rebrand this, call it iClass, and then eventually they stopped making that chip, so they had to emulate it, basically. Indeed. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, NVX uh, discovered a really interesting uh, implementation defect in, in reader firmware having to do with iClass and is giving a talk called iClass Throwing Away the Keys on Friday. In That's RF today. Village. Yes, today in RF Village. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. Talk. Yeah. Cool. We're excited. So let's talk about CIOS. So CIOS is that card technology uh, that was shown in, in the initial uh, video at the beginning of the talk. It is HID's flagship to this day, uh, launched in 2012. Originally, they called it iClass CIOS, uh, which now, you know, uh, you know may, may be a, an interesting decision, right, because iClass uh, has certain you know, connotations of, of weakened security, right? Um, but uh, at the time, right, iClass was a well-established brand name, so it, it, it helped really sell it to, to their customer base. But it, it you know, CIOS, honestly, it, get, it gets a lot of stuff right. Like, this is, this is a really solid credential technology. There's more memory, much better security. It's, it's very much standards-based, right? You don't have a lot of the proprietary uh, you know, algorithms and, 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 and uh, diversification algorithms and things like that that were being done with, with iClass and, and previous generations of they, technologies. They made tons of improvements. Yeah. Like they, it, this was like the Rolls Royce of credentials when it came out, uh, and the price reflects that, uh, as, as you can see. <laughs> um, but it had a lot of cool stuff, uh, and, um, you know, it wasn't really big on adoption initially because of the cost. But now it's actually very, very cost effective because they've had like 10 years plus to optimize it. Yeah, agreed. And, and it's also, you know, sort of a virtual credential or, or, or can be in a sense, right? So CIOS, there are CIOS cards. There are also CIOS uh, virtual cards or mobile cards, right? Uh, you know, if you've heard of like HID mobile access or, or things like that, right? Um, there are all these different, different uh, form factors, really, where CIOS can exist. Uh, so it's extremely portable, extremely well built. I'd say to this day, it's a very solid credential technology. Um, well. Now let's talk about support for other technologies with, with, within, uh, within the platform. So uh, SIOs, again, they made things very card agnostic, right? You're not relying on proprietary features of iClass or really any other credential. It's, uh, you know, a, you know, an SIO can be applied, you know, even to my fair classic, right? Another sort of uh, infamously insecure card technology. Uh, they're, you know, they're very much future proof. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, um, they're an extremely powerful technology. I don't know, Bobak, if you have anything you want to add or Nick. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 neat, the neat idea about a secure object is that it's agnostic. So you can take any container you want, whether it's an iClass uh, PicoPass container, or whether it's CIOS or Desfire, whatever flavor of little tiny crappy digital safe that you want to use, you can actually still put this concept of a secure object on there. And so it makes it very extensible and, and reusable. Um, and it gives them a lot more flexibility because they can control the data model. Uh, you can't control as much how the car technology itself behaves in the reader, but that's kind of splitting hairs a little bit, so we don't need to spend too much time on that. Yeah. Uh, but they really did try to intend for this card to be the one car that ruled them all, and they tried to be as forward-thinking as possible, and they really kind of hit that mark in a lot of ways, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. So let's talk about how SE credentials are encoded. Um, so to start, right, you have to obtain the binding from the card, really the serial number or UID of the card. Uh, you have to calculate diversified write keys. You need to generate a unique ID, right, for the secure object and calculate the keys for that, for encrypting the secure object. You gotta encrypt and sign the data. And lastly, you need to authenticate to the card with diversified keys and write that, write the SIO to it. And so that brings us to the iClass SE encoder, right? This is how HID enables customers to encode their own 
SE, right, SIO enabled credentials, be that iClass SE, CIOS, my fair classic, you know, with SIO, uh, that's SIO enabled, et cetera, right? And it came in two form factors, or it comes in two form factors. The desktop encoder, um, as well as a, an embedded printer based encoder as well. And uh, it can do a lot of stuff, right? It can encode, you know, primarily, right, it can encode genuine HID cards, but you can also encode third party cards as well. Um, right, it can you know encode prox, uh, lots of different high frequency credentials, including both CIOS, Desfire, iClass SC. Yeah, like, these were these were pretty cool little yeah. tools. Uh, not cheap, uh, very very expensive. But uh, you know if you had a need for it, it really kind of came in clutch. So it allowed you not only to create your own credentials on demand, but also it allowed you to you know create custom configuration cards and really enable being able to service your own platform a lot more easily than having to call the vendor every single time. So it definitely filled a very important business need uh, from that perspective. Absolutely, and, and yeah, configuration cards, that last one there, that's, that, that's an important one that we're gonna talk about, uh, about a little more in a bit. Um, but first let's talk about the target markets for this. Why did HID make this, right? Who, 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 who's buying this, who, you know, what, what is it used for? Right, so whether it's customers that have custom keys, right, for, for various security reasons, or they have a bunch of credentials that they want to keep, they don't want to have to buy new ones, but they want to re-encode them, like put it, put different date on them, or, or switch from standard to elite. Uh, they want to generate their own card numbers that HID doesn't mm -hmm. know about, right? Or they want to customize certain reader behavior functionality or load in keys, right? And so they want to create config cards. Um, a couple of these are a little sneaky in my opinion. Yeah. So for example, you know, we have customer generated card numbers on there. Uh, that is a very specific use case because what you may not realize or maybe many of you already do realize if you're in this talk is that by default when you buy credentials they are pre-programmed with card numbers and weekend information. So someone else is giving you a box of passwords to use and you assign those passwords. It feels kind of weird sometimes when you think about it. And so what the encoder would allow you to do, if you're really super secret squirrel about it, is you could get blank card stock. And you could have this encoder either at your desktop or built into your printer. Uh, and you can basically generate your own card numbers uh, and then you wouldn't have to worry as much about some third party vendor that you don't have control over knowing those critical bits of information. Of course, that's a lot of overhead too, because now you have to manage and remember all the card numbers that you used ever, so you can't repeat it. Uh, and in practice, it wasn't a feature that's used very often, but you still need to have that capability there. The other sneaky thing is integrator lock in. You might be thinking, how does that work? There have been a couple of areas globally where a integrator that has a really strong market presence will say, hmm, you know what? We're going to get our own custom key and all of our customers, we're going to issue them readers and cards that use our custom key. And so now if you're one of their customers and you need more readers or you need more cards, you only got one place you can go in order to get interoperable credentials because only they have the key. So we don't see too much of that in the US, but we did see some of that in Singapore and Australia and a few other places. So it's just really interesting to see how people kind of creatively use some of the features that are offered by the platform. Yeah. Indeed. So uh, the iClass SE encoder, right, the CP1000, that's the hardware. Azure ID is the software, um, right? It, 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 it doesn't exclusively exist for the CP1000, right? It's used primarily for badge printing, right? Um, but it is the software primarily that is used for credential encoding with the CP1000, and, and it sort of facilitates uh, all of these encoding operations. Um, yeah. this, is, this is the front end. This is the main default user interface for interacting with this piece of hardware. Uh, and it is a little bit clunky to use, I'm not gonna lie, um, but it's kind of the only thing that you have out of the box. Uh, some software vendors, uh, if you have a really large access control system, like say from Linnell or Software House, uh, some vendors actually are able to integrate pieces of this software, the SDK, 
into their access control software. So as a customer, when you wanted to encode a card, you don't have to load a separate application. You can just do it natively in your application and behind the scenes it makes the appropriate API calls, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so that's, that's how the SDK portion is designed to be used. Indeed. So let's talk about the internal operation of the encoder. Uh, essentially, right, everything in, in that box, right, that is inside of the encoder itself, which also happens to be rectangular in shape. Uh, so you have the desktop here, essentially the Azure ID software and normal operations, right? That talks to core, which acts as a router between different components in the encoder, sending messages back and forth, right? Which will send commands to the, to the SAM. The SAM will send commands uh, to the NFC front end. NFC front end talks to the credential, and, and that's sort of the, the overall sort of uh, block diagram of how encoding works. Um, and you know the, the, these encoders are they're very customizable. They're very flexible, right? You can use different types of keys with them. Um, one sort of interesting thing is that uh, you know HID does you know, sell these uh, encoders, but they're not unlimited use, right? They actually have a credit system uh, where when you buy an encoder, only ha you can only encode a certain number of cards of different credential it's types. It's super, super sneaky. You spend fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars on an encoder, you're like, cool, I can make as many cards as I want, right? Nope. <laughs> indeed, indeed. You can um, make thirty configuration cards. Out of the gate, yes. <laughs> on, 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 only 30, yes. Yeah. Um, so now let's talk about the, the reader side of things. So the iClass SE reader, it's generally what we call revision e-readers. Technically, there are some revision D readers that came before it, although they're very rare. Um, they can be ran as iClass SE, multi-class SE, and a few other things. They come in all kinds of different form factors. Um, uh, but I, uh, I, I can guarantee that most of the people in this audience have seen at least one. Yeah, it's the same piece of hardware internally. It's just marked up differently with different stickers and different software configurations. Yeah. Uh, and you know, of course, they make them in different sizes and shapes, but the primary circuitry and the design of it is still all the same. Yeah. So let, let, let's talk about how things are decoded, right? Um, so in short here, what's happening is that um, once, once the card is, is pulling back or, 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 or reading the encrypted data blob, now the SIO from the card, first it's doing a signature check, right, making sure that the data hasn't been tampered with. Then it's decrypting the data, and then it's parsing the weekend data, that, that, that same weekend data that Bobak was talking about earlier, right, that everything else is sort of a wrapper around, um, and, and sending it back to the door controller, which will ultimately decode it and, and, and make a sort of a, uh, a go, no go, or an allow slash deny decision. Um, so just, uh, and, and, uh, so this, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, this is kind of a cool zoomed in part of what actually happens inside the reader when dealing with an SIO. Yeah, so what Aaron just explained, is, like the job of that signature check is to see, has that data been modified? Uh, is that data bound to the UID or CSN of the car that it just came off of? So uh, after that step, and only if that step succeeds, does it actually do the decryption of that WeGAN data. And then once it decrypts the WeGAN data, it does the transmit step, which we all know and love. That's when we hear the beep. And uh, it kind of goes on from there. So uh, cool. yeah. Thanks. So migration modes. Uh, so in, My in, favorite the, topic. in the industry, <laughs> yeah, in, in the industry, there's, a, there's a, a type of reader called migration readers that are designed to support both old and new technologies, right? And, and like, they need to exist, right? Their, their existence is to help customers move from less secure, older technologies to more secure, newer ones, right? And so, so by definition, they have to support multiple credential types. And the most common one you'll see in the field is probably the multi-class SE reader from HID. It's literally the Swiss Army knife of readers. It reads you know, pr pretty much all the common technologies. Um, and even though they aren't always needed by customers, a lot of times integrators will install these and stock these because they always work, right? If you have to keep, if there's only one kind of reader you can keep in stock, right, to be able to, to, to sell to your, your, your customers, your clients, right, it stands to reason a lot of people are gonna go with the one that always works and 
that is indeed what happens it, a lot of the time. It always works as a big problem in the industry, not just with readers. So not only do we have these readers that can read all these different card technologies, you're like, oh, that's great. Uh, it's very flexible. It's always going to work. That's awesome. Except it also really undermines how access control works. Uh, similarly on the hardware side, when it comes to electric strikes and the door hardware that goes in the door, if you've ever slipped a latch with a card or anything like that, that's because that strike is either misadjusted or also very likely sometimes way too darn big for the actual latch and as a result those dead latch mechanisms don't actually work properly. But if they only carry one part that's just really big and it just works with everything, then it's just a lot easier for that integrator as well and they probably get a better price on it too. Indeed. And these migration readers open the door for so-called downgrade attacks, credential downgrade attacks, right? Because, uh, I mean, as, as we discussed earlier, right, uh, at the end of the day, uh, everything else is sort of just a wrap around that WGANs data that Bobic was talking about earlier. So as long as the right WGANs data gets sent from the reader to the door controller, it doesn't matter necessarily what the credential technology on the front end is. So you can take WGAN data from a, a, you know, a more secure credential that comes out of a reader and put it on a prox credential instead as long as it's supported. And as far as the door controller is concerned, it's the, sa it's the same thing. It's the same person. But we're, we don't want to bore you too much with this. It's really important stuff. Uh, we're going to want to uh, get to some more interesting stuff here in a second. But because it's good context, uh, we want to make sure you have a little bit of it as, at least. Indeed. Um, so let's talk about the iClass SE reader modules, right? So not all iClass SE readers look like a typical iClass SE reader, right? There are embedded modules where other vendors can actually take this technology, the, the, the reader platform, and embed it in something else, something that looks completely different, such as like a biometric reader or, or, or something along those lines. Um, so now let's talk about configuration methods for these readers. So it's all SNMPv3 based, right? Uh, which is an interesting choice of, of protocol we'll get to in a bit. Um, but, you know, it, it's SNMP3, SNMPv3 over APDUs. You can do it over NFC, BLE, OSDP, UART, et cetera. It doesn't matter. And there are a few different ways to do it, but, you know, generally for readers in the field, it's either with config cards or the HID Reader Manager app most of the time. Um, generally, when it comes to reader... Three minutes left. Right. Generally, when it comes to reader configuration, uh, you know, there are a lot of different things that you can do, um, right? Uh, and, and these configuration cards specifically uh, were, were a bit of a new technology with the platform. Uh, they're Java card based, um, right? Also known as the Artemis updater card. Um, and uh, if you encode one with a CP1000 encoder, right, they, you know, they have credits. Uh, ones from the factory have unlimited credits. Um, yeah. In short, HID config cards are the same as the Java, uh, are, are the same technology, right? They're, they're Java cards like a J3D081, just like many EMV bank cards, credit cards, et cetera, are. Uh, same, same platform, different use case. Uh, so let, let, let's talk a bit about how the firmware structure is yeah. set. Do you mind if I jump in on that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, so from a firmware perspective, we've got uh, those components we talked about earlier within the encoder kind of similar components within the reader. We've got that core, SAM, uh, we've got expansion modules. Each of these things have firmware. And all of those things have to be upgraded, or ideally they should be, up, be able to be upgraded. So uh, one of the ways that those things are actually updated is firmware upgrade cards. Uh, same interfaces that work for the config cards also work for firmware upgrades. So you've got the uh, NFC, BLE, OSDP, et cetera. Uh, although OSDP doesn't have as much market penetration yet as we'd like for firmware upgrades, but we're getting there. So uh, for firmware upgrade cards, there's actually this little plastic bracket that you hang because you have to, you like, to fit firmware on cards, you have to use a lot of cards, actually, if anyone remembers splitting RAR files onto floppy disks. A uh, bunch of disks to take Age of Empires home from school with the fast internet connection. But yeah, so uh, you've got a bunch of firmware cards, uh, really didn't get used. They were clunky, uh, could end up in like with brick readers, but ultimately like firmware upgrades are still kind of a problem even in this new, new, new platform. So, uh, but as we had mentioned, uh, this platform introduced a SAM, otherwise known as a secure application module. Its entire job is to protect secrets. 
So it's implemented on top of a secure microcontroller. Uh, it's, it's designed to be a black box to protect your secrets, whether those are cryptographic keys or uh, the like algorithms or intellectual property that makes your product unique. You can kind of put that into a black box and uh, with using a secure microcontroller, its entire job is to just protect those secrets. Yeah, do you so, mind if I touch on this a little yeah, bit? Before, yeah. So, so this is you know very similar to the concept of a TPM, basically. Yeah. You have a special processor or a special hardware module. Its only job is security. Whether it is you know storing keys or performing cryptographic operations, uh, and they're designed to you know resist really really advanced threats. Uh, this particular SAM was made by uh, Infineon. Ultimately, it was an SLE88. Uh, and one of the first things that we wanted to figure out is how do we get access to this so we can try to understand it uh, better ultimately. Uh, the SAM comes in a lot of different types and shapes and sizes uh, for different purposes, right? So you have these SIM cards, you have uh, you know, different physical form factors that can be used, they can go into readers, they can go into printers, they can go into third party products, but ultimately this is the piece of technology that is responsible for key management. And so inside of that SAM, which is kind of like a digital vault for keys, uh, there are you know, special write-only slots that you can only write keys to. You're not supposed to be able to read keys out of them. Uh, and these, as I mentioned, have both official applications and you might have heard some of the unofficial applications. <laughs> Someone owns a flipper. Of course, that's Eric, Eric Betts, uh, writer of Cedar. If you ever, you know, have used that, it's a super cool app. We can talk about it in our village later. Uh, but yeah, it's a basically, you know, this little super secure little guy, and you know, he handles all the important stuff. Uh, and so you put it inside of anything that you want compatibility with, and there you go. Bob's your uncle. Uh, the firmware is separated out into a couple of pieces. We're not going to get super deep into the weeds on that, just for the sake of time. But Suffice to say, it is a layered implementation uh, that builds basically a chain of trust uh, top to bottom to try to protect everything along the way. So there's multiple you know, steps and keys that you know, control what applications run on there, what data is accessible by what application, so on and so forth. But the reason I sped up a little bit there is because we want to make sure we talk about the most important part, it's the heist. And of course, you know, safety first, right? So we gotta, that's right. This is some high intensity stuff here, right? Uh, so, so let's talk about this process a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, Aaron and I talking a lot about one of the favorite aspects of, uh, of, of hacking this project is what? Yeah, so so one of the really great parts about this project is that you know a lot of reverse engineering work that you do involves sort of unraveling information that you already have, right? So whether that's reversing a binary in Ghidra and you're just trying to figure out what a bunch of you know uh, instructions are doing, um, you know that you're at the same, you know all, all the same, right? You're you're trying to make sense of info you already have. In this case, right, a lot of what happens inside of the SAM is sort of a black box. So we have uh, you know, a lot of information, but we don't have all the information. And so you really have to like, put yourself into the headspace yeah. of who built this. And you know, what, what, if they, if they you know, did X, Y, and Z, then how might they have designed you know, some other thing? And you have to make these really educated guesses and, and put yourself in the shoes of the person who And you gotta really yeah. stretch yourself. It crosses a lot of domains. Yeah. It's not just software, it's hardware, it's firmware, it's a lot of really cool stuff. So first we need to you know, think about this. How do we want to approach this? Well, where are the master keys? Let's think through all the places that keys are used and stored. Let's think through what kind of operations and what commands would have to use those keys. Uh, and then how do those keys get there in the first place, right? We got to understand the whole process and see if we can find any uh, you know, vulnerabilities in the armor, so to speak. So we identified our targets, which is anything with keys, of course, right? That includes standard readers, desktop USB readers, embedded readers, encoders, of course. That's one of the big things we're talking about today. Uh, configuration cards. The common denominator in all of these things is that iClass SE secure processor. It's that SAM, because that's, that's the one trusted you know, piece, that component that is allowed to do all this stuff. So how do we turn unknowns into knowns? Well, we gotta 
start touching hardware, right? So we need to get inside, see what we can uh, find out about what chips are used, see if we can tap into some communication buses, and just start trying to understand the language that it speaks. Uh, on the firmware side, we want to try to get a copy of anything we can get our hands on and start reverse engineering, right? That is like Aaron's and uh, Nick's bread and butter. I can poke hot, pokey things at hardware all day long. I'll cut things apart. But honestly, when it comes to the actual like hardcore reverse engineering, I still rely on geniuses like Aaron and Nick. Otherwise, I'm you know just not as effective on my own. Uh, but you know all the normal you know uh, techniques that you'd apply, we had to apply to these different domains: software, firmware, hardware, etc. Uh, as a fun story, uh, while we were working on this, uh, one of our mutual friends actually, who we didn't know was a mutual friend until we started this project, Vlad, um, he, uh, as a side quest, decided to look at uh, some, some readers. And there was this really fun uh, exchange that we had that he gave me permission to post. Uh, and he cut it apart and he just sends me this photo out of the blue. And he says, Bobak, what the fuck is this powder? The reader's full of it. Does HID literally put a felony amount of cocaine in every reader? And I corrected him, of course. That's clearly anthrax. That's how HID takes out their researchers. And of course, that explains a lot. Uh, but no, that's, that's not the case. Uh, this, is, this is just, you know, uh, epoxy fill. Uh, serves a couple different purposes, from weather you know, resistance uh, to uh, making it harder to get to the damn thing, like as evidenced by these photos. Um, but that was just the hardware piece. On the software piece, we had tons of other tools as well, right? You know, we had Aaron and Nick breaking out dot peak and Jeb. Uh, I was breaking out the Salia logic analyzer, and we were doing all this remotely. Like during COVID, you know, you were in San Francisco, I was in Phoenix, and tons of screen sharing. Way, way too much screen sharing. Uh, so lots of tiny wires, lots of you know hot, uh, you know, dangerous things blood, sweat, and tears, patience, and of course, a very, very healthy slash unhealthy dose of neurodivergent persistence. Uh, FCC docs, if you've ever you know, been curious, it's a great resource for finding out you know, preliminary information about hardware. Uh, anything that has a radio in it is required to go through FCC certification. So you sometimes get leaks of products well in advance of the product actually coming out. And I remember back in 2016, there was this you know, article on a, a tech site, like, oh, Apple is you know, working on this mystery device. You know, it has NFC and Bluetooth, and you know, maybe it's a new crazy airport extreme. And I looked at the sticker, and I'm like, dude, it says D1, D0. It's weekend. It's just a card reader. Uh, and yes, it was. It was just a card reader as you know, it came out uh, six to eight months later. And it's a custom piece uh, for Apple that they use in their facility, but we digress. We did FCC research on the iClass SE platform. We got some kind of blurry potato quality photos, so we had to get to that ourselves. We tried a lot of stuff, guys. We tried cutting acetone. I tried boiling readers in my apartment uh, to try to heat up the epoxy and make it more brittle. Um, I remember hitting it with like 1200 degrees of hot air and trying to chip away at the epoxy and it just sucks. Um, but that worked. I found that hot air embrittled the epoxy. Uh, it did not smell good. I probably have some stuff going on in my head as a result. But I'm here, and you're here, and we're going to have a good time. Uh, so here's a photo uh, that actually one of our close friends, Kevin, uh, 0xFFFF, took when he did the same process. And he's just a master at this stuff. And you can see it's a little bit clearer. And of course, there's our, there's our SAM, right? That protects the secret things. That's the thing that we're trying to hack. There's other chips in there as well. We have the RF front end, the HF front end, uh, the main microcontroller, which we refer to as core. Uh, and you know, we wanted to figure out, how do, we, how do we get to these SAMs? How do we get more access to more of them? And you know, readers aren't cheap, so we've got to try to figure it out. What I ultimately, by accident, figured out is that by a weird quirk of manufacturing, uh, on the back of the reader, if you'll notice, right over here, there's this debug port that's actually used for, uh, as an expansion port for external modules like Bluetooth and stuff like that. And something about the manufacturing process required them to put a little plastic bubble in that area. 
And wouldn't you know it, the SAM is right in that bubble with no epoxy surrounding it. So what I found is I was able to use one of my new best friends, that ultrasonic knife on the right hand side, and the official SAM recovery guide tool, which is just a piece of cardboard that I cut. Uh, here's the 1.1 version. It's the same thing basically. And I'll show you the process. This is sped up three times because this is already way too long, let's be honest. So I'm just drawing a little rectangle on there and I'm using the ultrasonic knife to cut through that top layer of epoxy and plastic. And uh, it goes pretty quick actually. I love this tool. If you do a lot of hardware hacking, wonder cutter, buy it. It's freaking awesome. And you saw I sliced through it there pretty quick even at 3x. Uh, and then boom, the board is exposed. Now that tool on the right, that's pretty cool actually. Those of you who wear glasses like me for a long time might remember seeing one in your optometrist's office way back in the day. Uh, and it's just a bath of hot glass beads. And I use that to preheat the reader to make it easier uh, to then remove that SAM using a hot air station. And so just after a little bit of time, we're able to recover that SAM and that was a very nice, efficient process of trying to uh, recover SAMs. And to be fair, this looks really slick, but it, we went through a lot. Uh, I damaged a lot and spent a lot of money uh, to get to that point. I uh, even had a little SAM cemetery and then I ran out of room and I just stopped. I had a whole pile of these dead damn things. Um, but ultimately, you know, what worked was choosing the right reader and, you know, doing all the things and great success, right? That's actually a pile of SAMs I successfully extracted out of a bunch of readers and all of them worked. I was very proud of it. Uh, but we wanted to see inside because why not? And so uh, we li I live in Las Vegas. Uh, there's a lo really cool local company here called Full Spectrum Laser. They make really cool stuff and for some reason they let me play with one of their fancy UV lasers. And I learned that you can decapsulate an IC with UV really, really fast. Um, it is destructive, of course, but uh, that is, that worked a treat. So thank you to Full Spectrum Laser for letting us do that. Uh, but these are some dye shots that, you know, Kevin took when he did a little, you know, acid bath process himself. And that's what proved that this was in fact the Infineon SLE88. Uh, and, you know, you kind of, you get where we're going with this. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here just for the sake of time. We want to show you the cool demo. Um, but the Artemis platform uh, is, was the code name for all of that hardware. And as was mentioned earlier, it uses SNMP v3 messages uh, to, you know, talk to different endpoints. Uh, if you're curious about this more, you know, come talk to us later. Maybe we can, you know, share a little bit more about it. Um, but you want, do you have a quick, uh, quick thing to mention about this? I want to make sure we have enough they, time they took to an approach get the using, demos in. Yeah, like standards-based protocols, uh, using an efficient protocol for an embedded system like this, uh, provides pretty good security, actually. It's yeah. really an interesting use, so I, yeah. Yeah. A uh, there's a couple different roles that we discovered, right? You know, there's OEM admin, there's HID admin. These are users, basically, that have different levels of access, uh, and that was critical for uh, the exploit itself, actually, right? Yeah, no, that uh, that very much was critical, and uh, yes, SNMPv3, while it is primarily a network technology, is actually a really good, uh, it's, it's used quite well in this platform. Yeah. So all this stuff is built on Java cards, which if you've never played with, they're super, super cool, but they're used for all sorts of different applications, everything from credit cards to access control, et cetera. Uh, the config cards use them as well, so you can update firmware and, you know, change all those settings, that used Java card. Uh, but config card operations, Nick, yep. take it away and so punch through this because this yeah, is important. When, it, when a config card is encoded, uh, the apple's initialized, it's told how much space it should have, and then after that happens, the encoder says, okay, here are the SNMP keys you should use when you generate messages, and then loads the configuration data that could be keys or configuration objects, things like LED color, et cetera. So uh, when that, like, that process is finished and you actually go to use it at a reader, the reader selects the applet, it, like, the reader itself sends the SAM like engine ID that it uses for the SNMPv3, and then uh, the username that it should use, that the config card should use to actually generate those messages. And then the reader says, "Okay, give me messages." And now we're at the heist, essentially. So uh, we looked at that set SNMP keys portion and found that like it requires a secure channel to do that. But uh, if you have a secure channel, you can actually change the keys without knowing them, without deleting data. So if you find a card that you can establish a secure channel with, 
you can then use that to set SNMP keys to zero. Uh, and then when you go and pretend to be a reader, you can give it a SAM session ID, you can give it a username, and then you can just get messages that are encrypted with zeros. So here is a demonstration of that exact thing happening. And in this case, we'll take the config card, we'll use it uh, with this, this standard PCSC reader, and uh, in this case, we're gonna take the a script here to zero, establish a secure channel and zero out those keys. And let me just go ahead and skip ahead. Oops, sorry. Oh, too far. I'm trying to zoom ahead. All right, go ahead. So in this, this, when this script runs, it essentially zeroes the keys out on the card so that we can then pretend to be a reader with the Proxmark 3 there on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see here the success gener messages generated by the card showing that the keys have been set to zeros. And then when we go and use that uh, config card with a reader, in this case our Proxmark 3, uh, we'll tell it to generate those messages. Nope, it's not letting me scrub through it. Essentially, uh, resulting you in the mic a little bit. yeah. Uh, Yay, tech problems. Yeah. Sorry, guys. A live demo might have been better. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this video will be uploaded. Yeah, uh, it will be uploaded. You know, we're, we're, we're uploading we're this time. version of the deck and the demo video, so you guys will be able to play it yourself as well. Essentially, we had a custom key encoded on that config card, and by zeroing the keys and retrieving that SNMP message, we were able to decrypt it and retrieve that secret key. That same process works for any key stored on an encoder, SAM, or secure element of any kind uh, in this platform. So uh, the config card impact of this is that if you can establish a secure channel, you can change keys and recover any sort of data that's on these cards. And that's the, the, the teal deer is, you know, Nick found a bug where you can zero out keys on a card and then dump messages from it. And if that card contained keys, you were able to then recover it. Exactly. So all of that is going to be in the video. Uh, you, you know, those of you who are into this can inspect it more. Uh, that'll be on the media server. Uh, and then the other thing that, sadly, I apologize if we were going a little bit slow earlier in the talk, uh, the main thing is the encoder attack. Now, the encoder attack is a little bit more devastating. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we are releasing uh, in video form all of the details of how the config card works. Uh, we're describing what happens here. We're not releasing any code for it because uh, after our investigation, the impact was going to be significant. Uh, but we are going to explain uh, how it worked, basically. So you want to touch on this? Uh, sure. Go ahead. So the way that the encoder attack really works um, is that as part of encoding a config card and loading key material into it, you need to have a secure channel. Um, but essentially what we found is that uh, the client is overly trusted here. So if you look, if we, if we cut out all the steps that involve initializing a secure channel, et cetera, we can just transmit the key in the clear. Um, yeah, so normally uh, what happens, and while this video is playing, uh, you know, during any key loading operation, uh, that encoder creates a secure session with the card to create an encrypted channel and then it transfers the key. And so you have this whole end-to-end -end piece that is like, you know, closed tunnel. Uh, what we found is that we could actually trick the encoder into saying, don't worry about secure channel session, just do your thing. So we were able to then instruct it, yeah, ignore secure channel, just load the keys to the card, you're good, you're good, it's cool. Uh, and then we used a Proxmark 3 to intercept those keys in the clear, because we told it to ignore secure channel, and using that method, we were then able to iterate through uh, keys uh, that were built into the encoder and actually then recover them, because we, we were able to, you know, find a defect in this very critical piece of implementation. Uh, and that, you know, all this works, you know, simple, simple mistakes can be made. Um, with apologies, we're, 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 we're unfortunately uh, out of time. Uh, we are going to share uh, these slides uh, and the videos. Um, the impacts that I just, if I could have an extra 60 seconds, if that's okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, 
the, these types of mistakes are easy to make from an engineering perspective, okay? Uh, and even though this is one of the most well-designed systems that we've seen to date, with enough persistence, we found problems. Um, and ultimately, you know, this was uh, a vulnerability that came about due to a lot of internal and external pressures from customers, from you know, marketing, from sales, all sorts of different things. And really it boils down to an industry still being hooked on Wigand uh, and looking for that interoperability. And what the main message that we're trying to drive home is that no vendor is safe, technically. This was one of the most secure systems on the market and we were still able to find problems. And really the issue is we're trying to you know, put patches on something that really isn't designed to be that secure in the first place, which was Wigand. But if you do your risk mitigation properly, if you're building your security like an onion, it's not that big of a deal. So the last thing that we want to leave you with, uh, depending on your threat model, and again, these will be in the slides, sincere apologies that we went a little bit slower than we had originally had wanted to, depending on your threat actor, that's going to define whether or not you have to do anything about this in any serious way. If you're just an average user, uh, and you're using standard keys, we do recommend that you move to a custom key like Elite Keys, and they're actually waiving the fees for this program for the first year as a result. If you're already using Elite Keys, you're probably fine. Uh, even though technically there may be advanced ways of recovering those out of a reader, it still takes a lot of skill and a lot, a lot of people know how to do that. Um, but if you're an advanced uh, you know, uh, threat person, uh, or customer, then you really want to upgrade your hard, hardware to the latest version, make sure you're using custom keys, and engage your vendor. Engage uh, you know, your integrator and HID and talking about your risks and what you're trying to mitigate against so you have a practical, real-world understanding of what your system will do, what it will not do, um, and that's, that's really the size of it. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Thanks for your patience. Apologies we didn't get through a couple slides, but that was really the meat of it. Um, and thank you. Thank you again. Really appreciate it.